You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. My name is Sean Wilkie, and along with my awesome co-host, we interview the innovators in this space every week. Very interested in this week's topic. Ivan, why don't you go ahead and get us started? Hi, I'm I'm Zach, and I'm happy to introduce John Craig. We're going to talk about neural networks and veterinary imaging. Uh, We're going to talk about John's business. He's a vice president of Epona Tech and vice president at Epona Shoe. His career consists of the PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University. He wrote an introduction to robotics textbook while he was a graduate student. And previously, he worked at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. That's the exact background that we look for people to start in the veterinary domain. John, welcome. I want to find out how did you get from NASA to veterinary medicine? (laughs) Yeah, well, there is a connection. Uh, I think the connection uh, for me started through uh, the horse. Actually, my wife is probably responsible because she's uh, big into horses. And, uh, you know, she had a horse that was often on lame. And she said, John, you're, you're like an expert in robotics. Robotics is about joints and motion and mechanics, and my horse is lame, and that's kind of biomechanics. And, you know, so we, we kind of set out together. I sort of brought some techniques from robotics into the horse world to analyze uh, horse motion and the way the horse is standing and measure the hoof. And that was the beginning of our first product, which was this uh, Metron software, which is uh, still around 20 years later as the heart of many DR systems and also a standalone software. And, and one of the things it does is help you measure the horse's foot. Um, since those days, it spread out to, uh, well, at some point we, we had a product and we said, hey, there's, uh, I think there's eight times more small animal vets than horse vets. We should spread this out and uh, try and sell to the small animal vets. So uh, then we spread out to cats and dogs and we we're measuring dog hearts and other things. And the software Metron, Metron is the Greek word means to measure. And we've always, from day one, had the uh, attitude that we wanted to measure things in images. That's sort of our specialty, sort of our niche. Um, And that led us into doing the right things with calibration systems and other things like that. So our our software is characterized by being easy to use and easy to get measurements from images. And we give a lot of help in how to take good images. And we have some tools and some techniques to take good images of cats, dogs, horses. We also spread into human medicine and also into security stuff for the military, but that's another story. So the main, the main focus is, is veterinary. So that's, that's the connection from robotics, biomechanics, uh, in the horse and into veterinary. And John, tell us about the names of the companies, Tech and Shoe and Epona in the front. What, what, what are we talking about? <laughs> well, Epona is the Celtic goddess of the horse. So Epona is, uh, means horse wow. essentially. So Epona Tech is horse technology and Epona Shoe is horseshoe. Um, Epona Shoe is a polyurethane horseshoe. So that's that's primarily my, my wife is sort of more on the shoe side. I'm more on the, the tech software side, although we do everything together. So we have a polyurethane horseshoe called Epona Shoe that's been on the market for 15 years now. So that's oh, wow. part of what we do. Yeah, so that's that's the name of the company. <laughs> and so, so you transition from working on jet propulsion to making horseshoes, and na- now now we're now we're in the AI uh, neural net world. Um, you seem like a guy that might get bored fairly easily. Is that is that an accurate assumption? Uh, there's a bit of that in there, yeah. Although I, I do have some, I'd say, long term stick to itiveness, uh, in that you know the AI now has kind of come around full cycle. Uh, my PhD back in the robot days was about uh, allowing robots to learn. So I had a robot arm that would wave around and by exercising itself would learn its own dynamics, learn how much friction was in the joints and would learn how to compensate for those things. And it would improve its performance every time it moved. And so, you know, from early on, I guess I have to say I I was interested in learning systems. And then with the software product, as I said, we're big into measurement. And what we built there was a product where the uh, veterinarian doctor would be prompted, you know, pick this point, pick this point, pick all these points, and then we'll compute these useful measures for you. And in the real world marketplace, we learned over the years that, you know, we sold to lots of vets who loved that idea and they were really happy they were getting a system that supported calibration and measuring things. 
But then when they got it and they're back to their busy normal life, well, they're, they're too busy to ever take time to pick the points and do the measurements. So they, they're happy it's in the software, but they don't use it enough. And then when they get an interesting case and they want to use it, well, they haven't really practiced and they're not good at how to pick the points. So there's always been this hump that we wanted to get over somehow. And the AI, I mean, 10 years ago, I was thinking, gee, if this software could find the points itself and do these measurements itself, that would get us over the hump. Then the vets would be forced to use it. They'd have these numbers in their face. They'd, they'd have to you know, embrace this stuff. And when deep learning came along, which was actually, as you guys know, quite recently, like 2012, it sort of hit the scene. That was like, aha, maybe this is what I've been looking for to automatically measure things. So I started on my mission there, but it's, it's the same old mission I've been on to to work on learning systems and things that could do things automatically. So we've had a focus now, the way we leverage the AI and the new stuff that's come out is that we're using it to measure things in images and, and do other things as well. We can categorize images, we could look for pathologies, stuff like that. But our focus has always been on measurement. And so we're focused on measuring things in images. And now the AI can do that automatically. It's I think it's fantastic. I'm, I'm super geeked up and excited about it because uh, we're finally going to get vets to fully embrace the full power. I mean, it's kind of a shame if you spend $50,000 in a DR system and it doesn't help you make measurements. It doesn't tell you how to calibrate things. So you can, and the veterinary world is used to taking radiographs and staring at them and looking for pathologies. And that's good. That's a big part of what it is, but there's so much more that can be done with these images. So we're trying to leverage that and push on that. So where, uh, that's fantastic. So where in the workflow, how do you envision your uh, technology assisting a veterinarian? Is this, so we're taking an image and then there's initial interpretation and then that guides veterinarian. So is it sort of guided diagnosis or you fully sort of measure uh, and give the sort of the clues or or is it really replacing a radiologist and we don't need that? <laughs> no, it's not replacing them, that's for sure. Well, that's a good question because it's still sort of an open question. And I think there, there are multiple answers. I, I think this sort of technology needs to be multiple places in the workflow. Where we've started out, where we primarily uh, work now, because we're we're in a commercial product, we're out being used by hundreds of users um, at this point for the AI stuff. Um, where we are now, it's part of the DR system. So you go out and as a veterinarian, take an X-ray of the horse's foot. As soon as that X-ray hits the screen, the system starts auto measuring it. And it measures the palmar angle and other things of interest about the, the horse's foot. So it's right in the DR system uh, is how we're doing it now. But we also have a cloud implementation, and that's the one that I think you guys looked at on our website, Metron Mind. You can actually do your own demo with it. So being in the cloud, so that cloud-based packs and other places like that where vets will receive images from elsewhere, and then they want to do some analysis on the image, the AI can be there as well. So I, I think it needs to be both places. It's particularly important, I think, to be right in the DR system, because part of what our AI also does is it tells you if you took a good shot or not. So uh, again, in the case of the horse, if you take a DP shot of the foot of the horse, that's kind of notoriously hard to take a good shot, particularly if the horse toes in or toes out. The software will voice announce poor alignment, which usually makes everyone in the room laugh. Um, and then the vet has to reshoot it again. And there's a metric of how well aligned you were with the bone column with the apparatus. And, and the software will voice announce something like generator more medial or generator more lateral, telling you which way to spin the generator around to get better lined up with the foot. So right when you're at the animal taking the image, it's helping you do that properly. And it's also measuring it right on the spot there. And so I think projecting forward a few years, I think every DR system should be enabled in this way that the minute you take an X-ray of the dog on the table, it pops on the screen and the heart's already measured for vertebral heart score or other things that are appropriate in the image. Someday in the near future, this will be the norm, this will be expected. And so, you know, we're trying to make that future happen today, as we say. <laughs> wow. Super interesting. And uh, sometimes I work with a lot of uh, startups and the executive teams. And sometimes I want in the meeting something to say poor alignment of the team. <laughs> so they don't really, yeah. I don't know if you, if you have that point. But um, so I, I'm still trying to imagine from the user perspective. So when it's built in, is this something that we are going to see uh, for positioning of the small animal as well? And is it only 
that we are looking at the measurements. Like you, um, uh, you give us an example prior to the show about the vertebral heart uh, score. Are there certain measurements that you go after? Or are you actually starting to interpret the the images and pathologies and and giving the guidance? Yeah, well, there'll be guidance for a small animal on the table as well. Just it'll be, I think. In that world, it's a little bit simple. We certainly, and there's other ways to do it besides AI, but you certainly can detect motion blur and tell the technician to reshoot. You can detect that they cut off too much of the thorax or, or, or this or that. So that sort of stuff will come. Um, but the, the I guess the measurement is the main focus. And the other thing I'd like to say about vertebral heart score, for example, or any of these measurement things, there's also a problem with AI that um, sometimes it's a black box and sometimes the doctor doesn't know if he can trust it or not, or, you know, how did it do that? And, and the prac, you know, we want to build a veterinary assistant. We're not replacing any job function. We're being an assistant to the veterinarian and the veterinarian has to gain some trust in the AI. So as you may have seen on the Metron Mind website of uh, the VHS system draws points and lines on the image. So it's very clear what the AI has done. And if the doctor is familiar with how vertebral heart score works, which they probably are, they'll actually spot an error if in the case the AI makes an error. So uh, it helps the practitioner gain trust that the AI is, yeah, it's helpful, it's doing its thing, and they can trust it. There's some other approaches, and I've seen some other companies pushing uh, vertebral heart score stuff where there's no markup on the image. Uh, the system just announces enlarged or normal um, and then the practitioner doesn't know how it did that and doesn't really gain trust. And uh, so I think it's, you know, there's a problem with AI getting overhyped and there may be a backlash. Um, we're, we're going actually very slowly and carefully. You know, we're not talking about automated diagnosis. We're really doing workflow things, helpful things, things that we make sure are going to truly work. Um, and be trusted and be useful to the practitioner and, and not get ahead of ourselves. So it's not always as glamorous as talking about the super high tech stuff that's going to replace radiologists. You know, we're not, we're not, we're not even close to that. We're, we're just giving tools and workflow things, but it's stuff that's really going to work and it's really pretty cool and kind of exciting. And then we just keep pushing and pushing and there's so many ideas and so much to do that I think it's gonna be a fun, a fun few years coming up, see how it evolves. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting. I like that approach. Me and Ivan have had a lot of conversations about AI and neural nets and machine learning. And I love Ivan's example of, you know, AI uh, really exists in PowerPoint mostly, as opposed right. to you know, some advanced application that's gonna save the world. But, you know, it's also interesting, John, I think where you've kind of started your journey in the robotics field and you know you you kind of tied back the work that you're doing today to the very beginning of your career and so i'd like to ask a big broad bold question which is you know what today in your opinion is the state of ai and also you know just for fun robotics as well you know like you know you're a guy that's really keenly interested in both of these things and you know if you were to tell somebody that you know, you met on the street, what AI is and where, where the state of the technology is across the field that you work on, you know, what, what would you tell them? What would you tell the average veterinarian that maybe has not dug into either one of these two topics? Wow. That is and just a little remark, Sean still thinks it's an artificial insemination. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, a lot of, I, I do hit that with a lot of veterinarians. So you have to be careful. <laughs> That's why I almost, I almost prefer saying deep learning. It's uh, less confusing with that. Showed out to all of Ivan's bovine bet friends out there. <laughs> well, that is a big, bold question, Sean. I think one thing that I would maybe say to people about AI or deep learning is that I think it's good to think of it in two big partitions because there's the one thing which people are now, and they're starting to give it new names. I think they're calling it uh, general AI. So that's kind of the far out stuff. That's where there's this talk about, well, does AI really understand what it's doing? Is it going to be somehow conscious? Uh, you know, is it going to surpass human intelligence? That, that's, that's all on one side. That's kind of the futuristic, the general artificial intelligence. And people are working on that. And that's a very interesting thing philosophically to think about. But I'm more on the other side of things, which is like the engineering side of it. John, can I ask you a favor? If, if you see that come along and you think it might be able to replace my co-host, if you could just <laughs> send me an email or give me a heads up, that'd be great. Okay. Send you a PM on that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
that's thinking ahead. So on the other side is the engineering side where you can just look at these things as big algorithms. I mean, the, these, these AI algorithms are big sort of pattern matching things and that we shouldn't be uh, really astounded by them or scared by them. They're things that have existed in the engineering world since at least the 1970s. They just didn't work as performantly. So it's really, it's kind of fun to have the hypey, excited world, but then there's the down to earth engineering side of it. So I'd always kind of maybe make that partition between the two. Um, and there's maybe a similar partition in the robotics world, uh, which has existed kind of forever. I can, I can remember, I actually worked in the robotics in the, in the late seventies. I'm so old now, crazy. And there's always been this partition between robotics happening at universities and the people writing all of these papers, which are doing all kinds of crazy things, swarm robots, you know, 500 small robots flying around and, you know, all this nice stuff. And then there's robotics in the industrial world that are, you know, spray painting our cars, spot welding our cars, doing all this stuff in the factory. And there's a big gulf between those two worlds. And they don't even talk as much as they should. So, um, the robotics world is uh, sort of, there's all this uh, excitement and hype on one side and on the other side, it's just slowly grinding away and, and doing actual stuff and, and getting ahead. So, you know, it's just uh, maybe good to look at everything uh, in that bifurcated mode between the, the hypey cool stuff of the future and then what's today's reality. You know, in the, getting back to AI, in the veterinary space, there's not that many actual commercial products right now available that, that are AI driven, right? There's not really that many and they're all coming. I think everyone's working on them. Uh, it's interesting just to, you know, brag myself. We, I think we're the first to have it for imaging and we showed up at the AAEP, the annual equine vet meeting in 2017 with software, which would automatically measure the horse's foot. And we thought this is going to blow them all away. And I also thought, well, I'm going to look around other booths. Maybe some other competitor has this too. But no, no one had it. Um, and then 2018, well, maybe someone's caught up to us now. No, no one had it. 2019, no, no one has it. So uh, it's good and bad. It's like, well, am I in the lead or the world doesn't care about this stuff? <laughs> um, and the big, the big companies that are billion dollar companies selling the big stuff, you know, we're not annoying them enough yet that they have to respond or notice. So, you know, that's on the business side, trying to figure out how it's going and what's what's important and what isn't. And so another another natural question for me is uh, what big problem have you solved recently? Because it, it seems like that's another one of your traits, John. And now I totally do remember meeting you at Western Vet. It took a little while, but um, it's all clicking in now. But yeah, what big problem have you solved lately and what, what one's keeping you up at night? Wow. Let's see. Hmm. Well, well, you know, I don't know. I don't want to give away too many trade secrets, but in getting some things to actually getting them over the hump to actually work, like the vertebral heart score measurement, uh, that thing actually ended up taking us two and a half or three years to get it to work. And we, we thought we'd just slam it out in six months. And within six months, it worked pretty well. But you know, the thing about AI, if you're trying to automate something for a doctor, if it works 90% of the time, uh, that's kind of a failure because that 10% of the time, the doctor is going to just get unhappy and say, oh, you know, now he has to do it himself. Now, if it doesn't do it automatically, now he has to figure out how to manually do it. So you haven't gotten over, you haven't freed him up from having to learn that and having to be able to do that well. So you really have to push it towards really, you know, as high as you can. So I would say right now we're at like 97 and a half percent. Um, all but two and a half percent images, the automation does it perfectly. The other two and a half, there's some outliers and there can make up to a 10% error, which I think is a little bit too much, although that's still kind of in the ballpark, but we want to improve that for the outliers. So some of the tricks to really push the performance up and get it to work are the things that I'm proud of and that used to keep me up at night. And now I sleep comfortably because I figured them out. Um, but yeah, so there were some tricks in there. there there's things about, uh, you know, the in the VHS, you have to put points on the spine right, to measure the vertebral length. And with repeated structures like the vertebra, uh, it's pretty easy for an AI algorithm maybe to get off onto the wrong vertebra and just be off by one. And that totally throws off your scale on the VHS problem. And also to do the VHS as defined in the original paper, you want to pick the cranial edge of T4 and the cranial edge of T9 to set the measurement on the spine. You don't want to measure from T3 to T8, even though that'd be 
damn close. You want to do T4 to T9. So the AI has to find those points and, and not get confused by the repeated structures or the similar looking vertebra to the sides. Um, so, you know, how you do that, eh, it's kind of it's kind of cool, but it's top secret. So I can't, uh, you know, spill all the beans here. But uh, that was that was a fun problem. And uh, each of the things we attack, you know, it ends up being more than just a neural network is, is the bottom line. If you if you're an yeah. expert in neural networks, that's great. But you need a lot of uh, surrounding algorithms before you can apply the neural network, essentially. So, well, it's you know, it reminded me of uh, uh, one of the developers on my team recently. He posted this. We have this channel where we post some funny things, and and he posted, "Why would you calculate something in twenty, like in five minutes?" I think the saying was, "If you can automate it in four and a half hours." <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's, it's always kind of, and it was funny because we had. Uh, we were talking about some prioritization of our backlog and and that was the whole point we were like deep into the product and then they spent 20 minutes arguing how you need to um prioritize things in the excel column and how would you code the excel <laughs> column to as we were wasting time here it's funny to see how engineers <laughs> think but you're doing an incredible thing and uh, i think that you know your approach everybody's kind of reaching for the stars and saying, you know, we're going to do these crazy things, but it sounds like you're very methodical, just like your career transitioning to, you know, to this right now. And I'm and I'm excited to see where this will lead in the technology and the background of technology. It seems like that's something that we might see in the um, natural build of the uh, new the arm and um, other X3 settings. We are up on time. Uh, I do want to ask you: Have you read, listened, watched, or? heard about uh, something interesting that you would like to share with our well, listeners. I think I, I did read one book. Well, I read several books, but one that I'll mention um, uh, <laughs> is, is a book called Deep Medicine by Eric Topol. Mm -hmm. He's a medical doctor. And it's kind of about uh, deep learning and AI coming into human medicine. And so it's a good summary of where we're at. And he gives a lot of anecdotes of things people are working on. But the overall thrust of the book is he's actually very upbeat and hopeful that like AI might sort of save human medicine because he is also very critical of the current medical system, how it works, how doctors have no time for patients and blah, blah, blah. And uh, he, he sees AI as a way out of that where it's going to improve it all and, and automate more things. The so doctors can send more times to patients and, and this sort of thing. So it's kind of a, a good book on many topics and, and also a little bit uh, optimistic and uplifting. So that's good. Hey, we could always use that, especially nowadays. Yeah. Um, so the last question um, we've got for you, and I just, I, I've got to mention one other thing. I, I like to steal Ivan Sunder. He usually asks the last two questions, but here I go, swiping it away. I read uh, an article this week, um, which we'll link in the show notes as well, about there's this concept of minimal uh, viable product that we're all very familiar with in the software world. And then this talk and the way that you guys are approaching um, your technology made me think of this paper that I read this week, which focused on minimal lovable product. So instead of, you know, a product that does not hit 90 percent right, like you had talked about, you know, get it as close to 100 percent so people can love it and it can just change the whole way that we launch products. So I want to tie that back. But last question is, John, I really enjoyed our conversation. This is really fun. And I, and I think we could have had an hour long conversation easy. But who is another person uh, that, you know, in the vet space, another innovator that you think we should have on our show? OK, I was thinking about that. And um, I guess I'd suggest this guy, Andy Fu. I don't know if you know Andy Fu. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I know Andy really well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we totally should have He Andy. was, uh, you know, the co-founder of Eklan DR, which is the first real veterinary DR system. And now he runs a company called Vet Rocket. And he's both a guy that can speak to the techie side, certainly, but also kind of the marketing and business side. So and he's a thoughtful I think a thoughtful, well-spoken advice. So. Thank you so much for listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. If you want to hear about our new episodes, please follow us on any social media channel. Also, you can check out our website at veterinaryinnovationpodcast.com. See you next week.